of the year. Okay, thank you. And um, looking specifically at an idea that was, I was first made aware of through a book by Carl Koenig called The Mystery of John and the Cycle of the Year. And I think that this book has been republished under a new title. I apologize that I don't know the title, but if you go to the Carl Koenig Institute, you can probably find it. And in this book, I think he's developing the idea that Rudolf Steiner gives in his uh, lectures on the cycle of the year as a breathing process of the earth. And so Rudolf Steiner describes how the earth forces in the different hemispheres. So in the Northern hemisphere, we're breathing out at summer solstice and then breathing in at winter solstice. And so we can have this experience of the, the forces of earth, but then also the soul forces of the human being being um, exhaled into the celestial environment at the, at the summer solstice time and then a full inhalation deep to within the earth at the winter solstice time. And then Carl Koenig goes on to say that not only is there this rhythmic breathing process, but this belies the living nature of the cycle of the year and that the year itself can be considered a being. And so I had this quote in the description that I sent to Andre and I'll just read it out. He says that, um, he says also in looking at the cycle of the year through the lens of the festivals, and he's speaking about the main festivals. He's giving this lecture at St. John's, but he's including Easter, St. John's, Michaelmas, and Christmas. Because a festival is a being, a great being, and has many different facets, in truth, every year it has a new countenance, and it is up to us to see it, to learn to behold, and to understand it. He goes on in this lecture, which is titled, he gave this lecture in 1963 and it's titled The Year as a Being. He goes on to describe how when we come to this full out breath at the summer solstice, that actually what we are breathing out is the impulse of the year that we are in. So we're in the year 2022 and we're reaching toward that full out breath. Just in a week, we'll, we will be at St. John's time. This is just three days after the summer solstice. And so the imagination is that we have, are fully breathing 2022 out into the celestial environment. And there it's as though it would co-mingle with the spiritual, cosmic spiritual forces. And then the in-breath begins and the formation of the seed for 2023 is then underway. So this I think is an awesome thought that the end of the year doesn't just come on December 31st, but they were actually already offering up something of this year and potentially receiving something that belongs to next year. So he goes on to say that in the festival cycle, if we're trying to look at the, the nature of this living being, something quite unique happens right now between the festival of Whitsun and St. John's. And so I'd just like to read this sentence. After Whitsun, the Christian year comes to an end. And so trying to build a bridge from Whitsun to St. John's is a rather futile attempt. It can't and it won't work. Even if only a few days remain between Whitsun and St. John's, there is a break, a complete hiatus, because at St. John's, something entirely new begins again. So he's saying that at this time, this, this full out breath, we're offering something up of this year to the spiritual cosmos, but there's this break that's happening between this in the Christian festival cycle. We've come through Easter, we've come through Ascension, we've come through Whitsun, and then this hiatus takes place. And then it begins again at St. John's. And so that beginning again, I think is it can be imagined rightly as this beginning of an in-breath and beginning to conceive the new year. And also when we look at the feast days, just after the Feast of St. John is the Feast of the Visitation, which is a celebration of Mary's visitation to Elizabeth when she is now carrying the Christ child and Elizabeth is carrying John. And even though this, this, this feast day is happening after the Feast of St. John, it's, there's something significant about these two expectant mothers that come together, that celebrated at that point in the cycle of the year. The full out breath has happened, at least according to Carl Koenig, 
something has ended in the Christian festival cycle, something new is beginning. And here we have this observance of two pregnant women. So it is as though we are conceiving the new year. We're beginning to, or at least create an environment into which the seed of the new year can enter in. And then one more quote from this lecture. And I will, he gave this in 1963, but I'm going to insert the year that we are now in. From now on, so from St. John's on, so that's Friday of next week. From now on, the year 2022 is freed. It is going up and carries its destiny with it. While the earthly year now prepares during the three months between St. John's and Michaelmas to receive the seed of the year 2023. So this is a very powerful contemplation and we are very close upon it. So what I would like to do, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And this is a picture just up the street from where I live, looking Northwest over Lake Michigan. So you've just got the title there, the official title, Seeking the Celestial Signature of the Year at St. John's 2022. But what I would like to us to do, especially given the idea that this cycle of the year can be experienced as a breathing process, is to take a moment to pay attention to our breathing right now as I walk us through the festivals that have occurred and, and the um, feast days, not all of them, since the winter solstice time. <clears throat> and so before doing that, I'd ask us all to take a moment to get oriented in your space. What direction are you facing? Where is the east and the west? the north and the south. Have a sense of where the sun is relative to the horizon, what time of day, even what the weather is doing in your environment. And then you don't have to alter your breathing, but just pay attention to your breathing. You can look at this picture of Lake Michigan, if it helps, this was taken the evening of the strawberry moon just a few nights ago, um, or you can just close your eyes and take a breath in and hold it for a moment and then let that go, breathe out and hold it out for a moment and then breathe in again and breathe out. And just in that rhythm of natural breathing, notice that at every in breath, there's a pause before the exhalation begins in the opposite direction. And once it fulfills, there's a pause and inhalation again. And this pause is the standing still moment, which is what solstice means, the standing still of the sun. So at the winter solstice moment, the earth has fully breathed in its forces and there's a standing still. That's the in-breath. And then a turn begins. For us, it's just a matter of seconds, if even. For the earth, it's several days. And then it appears for us in the Northern Hemisphere that the sun will begin to mount higher and higher into the north. And we get to the full out breath at summer solstice, which is coming on Tuesday, June 21st. Again, a pause for about three days. We come to St. John's and the in breath begins. And so I would just like us to imagine in this breathing to take the thought back and it doesn't have to be a specific memory but to go back to winter solstice, Christmas, the holy nights, to consider and to touch that place. What did I practice? What did I undertake? What was my contemplation moving through the sacred 13th holy night at New Year's Eve? through epiphany, continue breathing, thinking about uh, the weeks of epiphany leading up to the feast of Paul and his conversion at the gates of Damascus that comes there on J January 25th. And how this gives way then to the cross quarter time in the winter at the beginning of February 
when Rudolf Steiner gives this indication that all of the growth forces for the year are now present with the earth. So all of the growth forces for 2022 were present there. End of January, beginning of February. And one can imagine that also the initiative that one will take and what is new about what I will bring into this year begins to present itself. And they continue to breathe in and out, moving through February, which is a, a, a month that's named for Februa, which means to purge or to purify in anticipation, at least in the Christian festival cycle of the 40 days of Lent, which then would have begun at the beginning of March. And now moving toward the equinox moment where there's this point of balance. So it's not the full exhalation nor the full inhalation, but that point of balance between them in the spring as the sun in the north is coming toward the celestial equator and greater daylight is going to dominate. And then just after the time of the equinox, we have the feasts of the Archangel Gabriel, the Annunciation of Gabriel to Mary, about what she will birth in this year. We pass through the anniversary of the death of Rudolf Steiner. Breathing into April, we come into the season of the Holy Week. This year, the vernal full moon came on Saturday, Holy Saturday before Easter sunrise on April 17th. So calling to mind the experience that one had at that time. And then began the 40 days of teaching. This mystery of the risen Christ from Easter until ascension. And then the 10 days that we could say kind of culminate at least according to Karl Koenig, the Christian festival cycle from ascension to Whitsun and bearing in mind the despair that Rudolf Steiner points out was experienced by the apostles who felt that they had found the Christ being at the baptism, that they had lost this being through the crucifixion, they had found him again through resurrection, but this ascension seemed to be a contradiction and they had to find the will within themselves as we must each year again and again during those 10 days those self-directing forces that draw us toward one another and encounter in light of this mystery. And then while we're still breathing, there is this hiatus that Karl Koenig suggests that we are in the midst of right now, waiting for this moment of stillness and the full outbreath and the full offering up of what we have been cultivating and carrying with every breath until this moment, each breath, a part of this solstice stillness that is now upon us through these six months. So I just want to keep that in mind and to use it as a way to, for myself even, to keep a healthy breath as we go through now the content that I intend to share. And I'm going to say ahead of time that it leans toward the astrological. And if there's a question, if I've gone too fast or I've said something that you didn't understand, please put, put it in the chat. Uh, hopefully there will be opportunity at the end for clarification if necessary. All right. So first a little fun. And this is a picture out of the book that I did with my sister, The Star Tales of Mother Goose. And the little character that you see sitting upright, falling on his back and then upside down on his head, that's Humpty Dumpty. So Humpty Dumpty is probably one of the most popular Mother Goose nursery rhymes. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So I have the imagination that Humpty Dumpty is not just an egg, but Humpty Dumpty is actually the sun. And the wall that Humpty Dumpty sits on is the solstice moment, the highest place. And from that place, all the sun can do is fall toward the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. There's no turning the cycle of the year around and putting the sun back at that solstice moment. And as the sun comes up to that summer solstice moment and then begins to descend with the out breath that we experience in the, excuse me, with the in breath that we begin to experience in the Northern hemisphere, then we see the king's horses and then the king's men, these are constellations in the night sky, they begin to rise up in the sky. But what I want, the reason I wanted to put this picture up here was to point out 
that there's two lines, imaginary lines that we uh, imagine going around the earth. So one is the celestial equator, which is um, exactly coincident with the equator of the earth, but it's just imagined by astronomers to be projected out onto the celestial sphere where all the stars are. And you just imagine this line that's at the center of the earth and you project it out toward the stars. And that allows you to have a celestial equator. So you can talk about the Northern celestial hemisphere and the Southern celestial hemisphere. So this is not a line that we see in space, just like there's not a line around the equator on the earth, there isn't one in space. You can through mathematics and uh, uh, establishing coordinate points determine where that is. So we have this imaginary celestial equator and what happens is it appears to us on the earth that the sun, the moon and all of the planets are going around us. This is our perception, it's not our concept. We can conceive of our, we on earth being in motion but we, what we perceive is everything going around us. But the things that go around us are not going along the celestial equator. They're following a path that's called the ecliptic. And the equator and the ecliptic are tilted slightly toward one another. So you can see in this image, you have these two gray circles going around the earth and they're slightly tilted. And so when the sun comes to the place on its path where it's highest above the celestial equator, for us in the north, that's summer solstice. That's the full out breath. The sun is as high as it can get. There's a pause and then it's going to fall back toward winter solstice. Halfway, it's going to cross over the celestial equator. Equinox, equal day and night. So this is just an attempt to visualize what's being described when we use the words solstice and equinox. Solstice is standing still highest above or furthest below the celestial equator. Equinox is standing right at celestial equator, going either north toward the summer or south toward the winter. So just to get that sense. So we are right now like Humpty Dumpty on the right side of this image in the Northern hemisphere, sitting on the wall. We're coming to that moment of stillness and we're going to pause and then fall toward the autumn equinox after a few days, begin the fall toward autumn equinox. All right, so I wanted to show us then this, if you take that circle with the lines around it and you unfolded it, this is what it would look like. So the straight line going through the center, that's the celestial equator. So everything above that line is in the Northern celestial hemisphere. Everything below that line is in the Southern celestial hemisphere. And then that curved line, that's the ecliptic. And so that's the path that it appears to us, the sun is moving along and the moon is moving along and the planets are moving along, they're always on that line. You're never going to see them anywhere else in the constellation. You won't see the sun out there in the Big Dipper. It's not on the path of the ecliptic. And so just to get a sense of where things are on this path, this is the uh, winter solstice moment when the sun comes to that place where that star just appeared. And this is among the stars of Sagittarius. Then when we get to the spring equinox, the sun will be in front of the stars of Pisces when it's crossing over the celestial equator and day and night are of equal length and it's on its way to its summer solstice moment, which is what we are reaching toward now. And it arrives there among the region of Gemini stars. This is in the sidereal zodiac relative to the stars. If I were speaking about this in the tropical zodiac, I would have said that winter solstice happens when the sun enters Capricorn. The spring equinox happens when the sun enters Aries. The summer solstice happens when the sun enters Cancer. But that's a fixed division that bears the impression of the time when the Christ being walked the earth. Because the earth is slightly wobbling on its axis, that's not exactly what we're seeing happening in the sky now. So now winter solstice happens when the stars are among, when the sun is in front of the stars of Sagittarius spring equinox when sun is in front of the stars of Pisces, summer solstice when sun is in front of the stars of Gemini, and then the autumn equinox when the sun is in the region of Virgo. So just so that you have this sense, neither they're not wrong. It's just two different systems of speaking about where is the sun. So that star means to indicate the sun. And when the sun is there, you are not seeing the stars that are around it. So at summer solstice, we are not going to see the stars of Gemini. We'll see the stars that are opposite, which are the stars of Sagittarius. Now, the wonderful thing about Gemini and Sagittarius, although it's not shown on this map, 
is that this is where the Milky Way comes through. So in addition to having the celestial equator and the ecliptic, we've got the spiral of the Milky Way going around us. <clears throat> so when, we're look, when the sun is in the region of Gemini and we look, so if the sun is setting in with Gemini stars and you will look east, you'll see Sagittarius starting to rise up. And that's actually where we find the richest part of the Milky Way. That's where the center of the Milky Way galaxy is if we were to travel toward it. And so that's the most heavily populated region of, of sky with stars in our night sky. So we're coming into the season where we get to really see all of those stars. So again, this is to just give us orientation and to point out that the sun coming to its vernal equinox point in front of the stars of Pisces is coincident with the Piscean age in which we find ourselves. And so this is the fifth cultural epoch and it's referred to as the Piscean age. So some of this I talked about last time and as I said, it was not a requirement to look at the talk that I gave in March, but I'm just going to go over a little bit what I had introduced there. This is the traditional glyph for the, um, the constellation Pisces or the sign of the Zodiac. And so it's got these two curved lines that seem to face each other with this one line going through the center. And what I imagine is that that center line is like the threshold and everything below that threshold is what we encounter in the day-wake consciousness of being in the physical world on the earth. And everything above that line is the encounter that we can have with the spiritual world. And that not only is it that I can come to an encounter of myself in the physical world and across that threshold in the spiritual world, but we are encountering one another. We are coming face to face. This fifth post-Atlantean epic is about this encounter with self and with the other. And particularly as the Christ being says, wherever two or more are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. This belongs to the Piscean age. And it's not an experience that happens once, but that will happen throughout this entire age. And so I think I've put the, the dates up there. So uh, astrologically speaking, the Piscean age is from 215 to 2375 AD. So you can see that although the, the band, the fifth dimension was singing about the age of Aquarius as early as the 1960s, we've got a ways to go yet before we get there. So we're still in this Pisce Piscean age of experiencing potentially or developing the capacity to experience the self both physically and spiritually, and not only to experience that alone, but to experience that together with the other and out of shared striving. And so I wanted to look at how this shows up in the John gospel, particularly because we are coming toward this season, uh, the festival of St. John, and we're at this moment of full out breath where something can be realized in this imagination of the, the soul forces of the human being breath, being breathed out into the celestial spiritual environment. And there we encounter something that has to do with the mystery of what's coming toward us out of 2023. And as anthroposophists, we're coming toward these really significant 100 year anniversaries in the history of the anthroposophical movement. So it seems like a really good time to be paying attention to what is it that I'm experiencing in those threshold spaces, waking and sleeping, encountering the other in the thought life, in the dream life, those places where I can really sense something that's coming toward me. I might be stepping into a forest, stepping into the lake, where are those crossing points where I can be awake to stepping into a different relationship? And so what I think is interesting in the beginning of the John gospel, not at the very beginning, but in the first chapter, is that John speaks, uh, he writes in this description, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And so at this point, John sees Jesus of Nazareth and recognizes that he is as though you could say the Lamb of God is the fruit of the Aryan age of Aries. So that that has been fulfilled. And now that this Jesus of Nazareth comes before him, he is like the fruit of all that Aries had to offer and something new is about to happen. This age of Aries has fulfilled itself. And then two verses later, he says, even though he is saying in verse 29, I saw Jesus of Nazareth, then he says, and I knew him not. 
but that he should may, be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? So you can imagine that in verse 29, there's this encounter between John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And that Jesus of Nazareth is carrying toward this moment in these few words indicated here as the Lamb of God, all of the fruit of what preceded that moment, particularly expressed through the fulfillment of the sun's movement through this region of Aries stars. Aries is the ram, the offspring of the ram is the lamb. And here is now not just the offspring of the lamb, but the lamb of God. And so the, the Jesus of Nazareth, John recognizes is coming toward him as the fruit of everything that has preceded that moment. But then he makes this unusual statement, I knew him not, but he's baptizing with water, which is the element of Pisces. And the encounter between them is going to be a moving across this threshold. They come face to face, there's a, a recognition, but then something new is presenting itself. And I, I'm thinking about it this way because it's possible that when we encounter one another, that we might have a recognition, but then there can be something else that rises up that at first we don't know. What is that? How can I take hold of that? I'm in a face-to-face -face encounter and what is there that's new that's presenting itself? particularly at this point in the cycle of the year. Now, this verse goes on two verses later, then John says again, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So now this is the new step that's going to be taken. He recognizes Jesus of Nazareth, as the fulfillment of everything that has preceded that moment. But before he's baptizing, he can't see, he doesn't know what this is going to, to bring, but he will bring the baptism and then this new thing will present itself. And then when we get to verse 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the son of God. So he goes from, you could imagine recognizing Jesus of Nazareth to then recognizing the Christ being but there's two stages in there where he says, I knew him not. So just thinking about this as kind of an archetype for encounter with the other, when we are trying to awaken to the true spiritual nature of the other, is it like this? Is it that I meet someone that I know in the physical world, John and Jesus, they knew each other, but then the spiritual mystery that's presenting itself at first is not quite tangible enough that we can recognize it, that something has to enter in to that face-to-face -face encounter. We're going to move across the threshold together. And that this is what the Piscean age is about. Coming to recognize the spiritual reality of the self and the other and the self in the other. And so I see this living in this Piscean glyph where we have that threshold, imagine that threshold as that line coming across the middle and then these two curved lines facing each other as that face-to-face -face encounter. And I think that it's not inappropriate to think about it as the encounter between John and Jesus, both prior to the baptism, through the baptism, and afterward moving across this threshold from the physical, spiritual, material world into the celestial spiritual environment. Then also, as I pointed out when uh, I gave the talk in March, that Paul also speaks of this in his uh, first letter to the Corinthians chapter 13, when he says, for now we see through a glass darkly. So this now would be below that threshold in the physical material world. We can see the physical stuff, but we don't see as in when you're looking in it through a, a mirror, you're not necessarily seeing an animate living object. It's just what you see is a reflection of the self. But when you move through that mirror, when you move across that threshold, then you see face to face. Now I see and now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So I think of this as a hallmark of our fifth post-Atlantean epic, this Piscean age that very much has to do with this experience of knowing the self in the threshold. And this will go on through the entire period. It's again, it's not just a one-time experience, but it happens again and again. Ideally it grows. And so that we can know one another as brothers and sisters in this striving to, in a shared spiritual striving toward a realization of the Christ consciousness on the earth. 
Then also I had talked last time, I'm going to talk about this again this time because I see something similar happening in the celestial picture for 2022, that there was a very interesting configuration that happened in the sky five days before the foundation stone for the building of the first Gertianum was laid into the hill at Dornach. So that foundation stone, which was a 12-sided double dodecahedron, was laid into the earth in the evening on September 20th in 1913. But five days earlier, there had been a, a full moon. And so the moon was on, well, first here's the earth. And then the moon was on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. So that's just meant to, none of these things are to scale. So just wanted to say that. So that red line is indicating the orbit of the moon around the earth and it's elliptical on purpose because the moon does not circle us. It doesn't circle us. It goes in an ellipse, which means that sometimes it's closer to us than at other times. So this is why you hear about a thing called super moon or perigee moon. That's the moon that's closest to us. Then um, the sun was standing opposite the moon from the earth. And so this is, we had this uh, full moon. And then Elizabeth Rita, as I shared last time, said that we can, it's not in error to think about the planet Mercury orbiting the sun as having the same kind of relationship with the sun as our moon has to the earth. And so you can imagine that the moon is kind of a, a guardian orbiting the earth and that Mercury is similarly a guardian orbiting closest to the sun. And speaking here about astronomical Mercury, the planet that we regard as the one that is closest to the sun, which is the planet that Rudolf Steiner referenced when he laid the document with the foundation stone. But so what happened is it wasn't just a full moon, but the moon was actually totally eclipsed on September 15th. Also that day, Mercury was at superior conjunction. So Mercury will spend part of its cycle on the opposite side of the sun from the earth, but it's not always exactly at the same degree of the zodiac. And the moon will spend part of its cycle on the opposite side of the earth from the sun, but it's not always at full phase. So this was a really interesting configuration that on September 15th, 1913, five days before the foundation stone was laid, there was a total lunar eclipse and Mercury was at superior conjunction. And so what I had suggested last time was that this is as though a face-to-face -face encounter between the earth and the sun, because it's as though they're two guardians, the moon and Mercury were on opposite sides. So from one another, so that earth and sun were coming to this kind of Piscean face-to-face -face encounter. And then what happened five days later was that the foundation stone was laid and Mercury was the evening star. And the reference that Rudolf Steiner made to it was at that moment, Mercury came to the balance. So this balance is a reference to the point of the equinox. Now Mercury was ahead of the sun at that point. It met the sun on the 15th and it sped ahead. It got to the equinox point before the sun did and then the foundation stone was laid. So Mercury standing in the balance at this place where day and night are of equal length. There had been a total lunar eclipse, Mercury had been conjunct the sun, and now it stood in the balance. And then this deed was undertaken. So this is a significant celestial signature. Then this is the quote from the bottom of the document that was laid with the foundation stone, that this stone was laid by the Johannes Building Association on the 20th day of September, 1880 after the mystery of Golgotha, that is 1913 years after the birth of Christ, when Mercury stood as evening star in the balance. So I just wanna show us this star map again. And so that you can see over here on the right-hand side where I've drawn that circle, that's the point where Mercury was. That's the equinox moment. And the sun was not there yet, so it wasn't equinox yet but Mercury got there ahead of time as the witness from the point of balance to this deed. Okay, so this is significant for me right now. And the reason I'm re reiterating it is because this picture is showing up again this year. And I think it's more than a coincidence that as we're coming to the 100th anniversary of the fire that destroyed the first Gertianum upon, that was built upon this foundation stone, that 
we have something sounding out in the cosmos that seems to call to mind this particular moment again. And so this will happen on November 8th this year, 2022. Okay, so remembering our breathing, we are still going toward this out breath that, that will be fulfilled between the three days between summer solstice and St. John's, and then the in breath begins. So in November, we'll be already on that in breath and coming toward its deepest place. On November 8th, there's the earth again. There will be a full moon and Mercury will come once again to superior conjunction with the sun. There will be a total lunar eclipse. Mercury will be at superior conjunction. Same configuration. It's not in the same region of the sky but it's the same players doing the same thing. Potentially then once again, earth and sun having this face-to-face -face encounter while their two guardian satellites are on opposite sides from one another. So this is, this is just an imagination of a picture of what is the gesture that's going on? What is the celestial signature? What is the, the imagination that I can bring to this phenomena? What I am saying is not the hard and fast, only fact and truth about this. It's an imagination. Could it be this? And does it matter at this point in the history of the anthroposophical movement that such a configuration is sounding out again? All I can do is ask the question, mark the date and pay attention. What is it that's taking place? How might I be informed in my working with the foundation stone meditation or with the contemplation of the mysteries that were um, described through the art and activity of the first Gertianum, how does that live in this configuration? Is this a celestial signature of that deed that took place on the earth? So once again, we see that we have earth and sun in this, what I'm calling a very Piscean encounter with one another, but there's one element that's different that's going to be happening this year on November 8th, and that is that the planet Uranus, the symbol over here on the left, will be in line with, with moon and earth and sun and mercury. So this is really fascinating when you consider what is it that Uranus represents and are we correct in our understanding of what Uranus is? If we look at it phenomenologically, the planet Uranus was the first one to be discovered with the use of a telescope. So since the beginning of recorded history, we have what are called the classical planets appearing in art and representation that ancient human beings made of their understanding of their environment. So the classical planets being those that we can see with the naked eye, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Sun. It isn't until we get to the 1780s that Uranus is discovered with the use of a telescope, technology that's created by human beings. And so part of the interpretation of Uranian energy is that it brings innovation, it has to do with something new. It has to do with what a human being can bring out of inventiveness and out of taking initiative. It is oftentimes connected with um, electricity. When William Herschel first saw Uranus, he thought it was a comet. And then when he saw it again a year later in the same region of the sky, he realized that it wasn't a comet, that it hadn't moved and that potentially it was a planet. It's interesting as an American, that he was working, uh, his patron was King George III, and he wanted to honor his patron and name his new planet after King George, call it the Georgian planet, but the American colonists in 1781, they're at war with King George. The French weren't too happy with King George either, so the astronomers in those different nat nations, well, those different regions said, we're not going to call it George. That's not going to work. It's not going to be Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, George after a king that we're at war with. And so it took a while before the name Uranus was given to the planet. And Uranus rooted in the ancient Greek mythology of Uranus, god of the sky, out of which Saturn comes into being. He's the father of Saturn. He's the sky god. And then out of that space, something comes into time. And then we have Saturn. Okay, so these are some of the, the qualities and ideas that are connected to um, astrologically, to thinking about the planet Uranus. But then I also want to look at the, oh wait, one more, one more thing before I get back to Uranus. 
take a breath. Remember that at the time of the laying of the foundation stone in 1913, Mercury had moved ahead of the sun into the point of the balance, which was equinox. What's going to happen this year, you have this lineup, total lunar eclipse, Earth, Sun, Mercury at superior conjunction, and Mercury is going to move ahead and come to the point of solstice. So this is a little bit of a different gesture. So thinking about Mercury as witness to this deed of laying the foundation stone from the place of balance, and now Mercury witnessing, you could potentially say a commemoration of a significant event in the history of the anthroposophical movement, but witnessing it from the place of stillness. So I just wanna show where that's going to happen, where I've drawn this circle. Now Mercury, rather than being up there on the left, at the equinox point on no, uh, after November 8th, it's going to move ahead of the sun and on December 7th, it will come to the solstice point. So it's a couple weeks ahead of the sun getting there. But Mercury is this witness. Mercury is escort of souls. He's a psychopomp that takes us across this threshold. And so I think these are interesting elements to hold in mind as we think about we're, we're, we're not fully at the out breath and yet we already can begin to, I think it's not unhealthy to start to imagine what's, what's coming toward us as we come to the fulfillment of what 2022 will be about and how can this type of celestial configuration prepare us, inform us, hopefully not hinder us in thinking about and being prepared for what's coming. And then also I did want to point out in looking at the traditional glyph for the planet Uranus, hopefully, without too much imagination, you can see a bit of Pisces going on there. We have at the top these two lines facing each other and that threshold line going right across the center. And then we have another straight line coming down through the middle with a circle at the bottom. Now this is an imagination that I've developed that what I imagine is given that this planet Uranus is discovered during the Piscean age, which has about it this quality of our coming face to face with the self in the physical world and as spiritual beings, that this happens on the earth and that cross represents the earth and what the, our capacity to witness that in the Piscean age is directly related to the incarnation of the sun being, which is the Christ represented by that circle at the bottom. So it's possible to imagine in the Iranian glyph that we've got this Pisces encounter in the threshold happening on the earth as the result of the Christ incarnation. So now if I add that to the picture of what's coming, total lunar eclipse lined up with earth, face to face with sun, Mercury at superior conjunction, and I bring this Uranian quality of what this fifth post-Atlantean epic age is about, or this Piscean age is about, it really starts to create, I think, a dynamic picture, a dynamic potential. Um, I did say that Uranus is aligned oftentimes by astro astrologers to kind of an electrifying quality as though uh, a flash of lightning happened and things lit up, but then the next moment the lightning is gone and there's this question like, did that even happen? So Uranus is as though an energy that wants to bring change or instigate change. There's a certain kind of freedom connected with the impulse or an opportunity for seeing something anew, which I think could be a healthy thing to experience right now in that it's looking again at an event and trying to find something new in it or bringing something new to it. So I'm just going to put that there and ask us to hold it. And then I'm going to develop the picture a little bit further. Hopefully I'm going slow enough that you can hear the thoughts, if not all the way digest them, but they're not coming at you rapid fire. <laughs> trying to remember the breathing. All right. So before we get to November 8th, Uranus is going to do something interesting. And that's coming much sooner. And that will be on July 31st, 2022. Just a little over a month from now, about a month and a half from now. So the picture that I'm going to show you first actually comes from an Aristotelian model and imagination of our planetary system, where you have this celestial sphere, 
then the quintessence and the planets would move around in that quintessence. And then you have the lunar sphere. And then below the lunar sphere, elements expressing themselves as fire, air, water, and ultimately the most dense into earth. And so according to Aristotle, on the earth, we live in the sublunary world, which just is a sophisticated way of saying, okay, we live below the orbit of the moon. So you can see that black line, that's the, the lunar sphere. So it's not the moon itself, but it's the path that the moon describes around the earth. We got really esoteric about it. You could say, yeah, that is the moon and we live within the moon when we're on the earth. So Rudolf Steiner talks about this in the interdisciplinary astronomy lectures. I'm not going to develop that thought, but just to say that, okay, we're living within the moon sphere when we are on the earth. And the way Aristotle described it is that time in the sublunary world where we are moves in a linear fashion from beginning to middle to end. But when we move beyond that lunar sphere, then something else is happening. And the laws that belong to the elements that are recognizable and tangible in the physical world are changed. And we can't just apply those laws to things beyond that sphere. But in that lunar sphere, there is as though uh, there are two doorways, you could say. One that allows something to come in from the celestial spiritual world into the sublunary world, and the other that allows things to go from the sublunary world back into the uh, celestial spiritual world. And these two points are called the nodes of the moon, N-O-D-E-S. They're always exactly opposite each other. There's a north node and a south node. And they, while all of the planets can be imagined as going, or we see them going in prograde motion from west to east, the nodes are going from east to west. We would call it retrograde. So it's as though they're scooping up all the experience that we're having and rhythmically dropping it off. The nodes are not an object, they're just points in space that describe an intersection of planes, but it's like an opening. Something comes in from the spiritual world at the south node, something is offered out into the spiritual world at the north node. And so on July 31st, what's going to happen and what's being talked about a lot in the astrology community is that the planet Uranus is going to be in the same region of the zodiac where the north node of the moon is. This is called a conjunction. Okay, so the north node is this opening and it's as though we're offering something from the earthly world, from the sublunary world out to the spiritual world and there's Uranus. And it has this kind of innovative quality. It seeks what's new. It wants to inspire invention. It has an electrifying quality. So we could think about that also as not something that's, something that's constant. It's kind of erratic. And so looking toward July, it's as though there, there could be this opening, but it might not be easy to settle it at first. And in addition to Uranus being there right at the North Node, the planet Mars is going to be there. So Mars is action and activity. And so there's the potential there for really high, heightened activity. Mars is also speaking, but speaking without thinking. And I have heard astrologers connect the kind of inventiveness of Uranus with, the, uh, with a study of astrology or the knowledge that comes toward us from astrology. So I would take the next step and say, oh, maybe this has to do something with the mystery of our speaking to the stars in reference to a verse that Rudolf Steiner gave to Marie Steiner at Christmas 1922, 100 years ago this year. So there seems to be something sounding out that has to do with a call to humanity to wake up to the fact that you are speaking to the stars, almost whether you know it or not, whether we know it or not. We speak through our ideas, through our hopes, our wishes, our dreams, our gestures, our decisions. And we can try to do so specifically not just by speaking, but potentially through ceremony that's aligned to the cosmic rhythms, to pausing the outbreath, or at the cycle of the year when we come to solstice and St. John's, to honor and acknowledge what comes toward us out of the mysteries of that festival time and look as, toward it as the, the fire that flames up in the celebrations at St. John's is something that also from the earth is fructifying this seed that would begin to form that has in it the substance for the coming year. 
2023. So Mars also is described astrologically as being connected with forward action. Um, one of the ways that I've heard this particular configuration described astrologically, this conjunction of Uranus, Mars, and the North Node, is that it's a bit like an acrobatic stunt. And the quest and the challenge will be how to land it. So potentially taking a great jump, doing something like a daredevil, but then how do I bring that down to the earth? So it can be really innovative, but then it's got to, got to find its feet on the earth. Okay, so this is almost, you could be imagined like an activation of the Iranian energy before it lines up with moon and earth and sun and mercury on November 8th. So I will be looking at this to see what is it that's taking place there at the end of July. Well, first and foremost, what is it that potentially announces itself at this time of St. John's? What am I carrying within myself to this time in the cycle of the year? And can I sense what I might be receiving from the spiritual world at this time? Is it going to be activated during this July time? I don't know. I just, I have to live through that time and see. And then how can I take the experience of this toward and into what I might do on November 8th when there's this lineup of these planets. For me, it's definitely going to be connected with the contemplation of the foundation stone meditation and also of the foundation stone itself and the deed of Rudolf Steiner and laying this foundation stone as a foundation for a spiritual community of humanity that could awaken to its spiritual nature in the physical world and stay awake to that across the threshold of that kind of that Piscean imagination. Okay, so Mars was also part of that picture. And I wanted to point out, I, again, I apologize. I did warn us it was gonna be a bit of astrology here and it gets a little bit technical, but every two years, the planet Mars will make a retrograde motion. So all of the planets do this. So Mars does this every two years. Jupiter, Saturn, they do this every year, but Mars only, every two years. And so it just so happens that the Mars retrograde will begin on October 30th. So just at the, just at the time of All Hallowed Eve, and then it stays in its retrograde until the 18th of January. So through the Advent time, uh, yeah, through the festivals of the dead, through the Advent time, through the Holy Nights, across the new year, through Epiphany, and then it turns direct. So a Mars retrograde is a very interesting period of time. The cycle begins when Mars comes to conjunction with the sun. It's in the same degree of the zodiac with the sun on the same side of the earth. And then it moves on. And a year later, it will be opposite the sun. And then we get this retrograde. And this is also when it moves closer toward us. So this is a really important time in the Mars cycle that has to do with I mean, Mars is, can be described as being confrontational, but we could say that confrontation is confronting or coming in front of something, facing something, having the wisdom to face something, the courage to face something, potentially the ability to say yes in the face-to-face -face encounter. I recognize the spiritual nature. There's a certain quality of not charging forward when the Mars is retrograde. So an ability to stand and to hold potentially and not just move forward, but to have patience to allow the mystery to present itself. Um, it's also in a wonderful book by a student of Dane Rudyard called Cycles of Becoming. He describes the moment of the Mars retrograde as a time when mistakes can be repaired, wrongs can be righted, Forgiveness, um, you can have the initiative to do what you haven't done. And what's interesting to me about this retrograde is not only that this is the peak of the Mars cycle, but Mars will come to its exact opposition with the sun, which is the peak of the moment on December 7th, which is the same day that Mercury comes to the solstice point. So I hope this isn't too much to hold but there's a lot of players and this isn't all of them. I'm not going to touch all of them. Just wanted to highlight what I'm seeing in the picture is that when Rudolf Steiner was preparing to lay the foundation stone of the first Gertianum, there was a significant lineup 
of moon at total lunar eclipse with Earth facing the sun with Mercury at superior conjunction. Mercury raced around to the point of balance. Then the foundation stone was laid. This year on November 8th, we have the moon at total lunar eclipse with the Earth face to face with the sun. Mercury at superior conjunction. Now Mercury is going to move ahead of the sun and come to the point of solstice. And at that same time, Mars will be opposite the sun, which is described as a moment when a mistake can be repaired, a wrong can be righted. And in that lineup, the planet Uranus is also active, which brings change and innovation. So this is a pretty powerful dynamic. And I think that it's something that it's worth knowing about, particularly as we're fulfilling in this outbreath with um, at this at the solstice and the St. John's time. And so I wanted to kind of bring this imagination round to a close and just looking ahead to the fact that at the um, New Year's Eve this year, we will come to the 100th anniversary of the fire that destroyed the first Gertianum. And this is an image by William Blake of his rendering of the refiner's fire, which happens in Dante's Purgatory in Canto 27, just before Dante passes through to the earthly paradise. And in order to get to the earthly paradise, he has to pass through this fire and he's terrified. And I think that this is a significant spiritual mystery about the role of fire and its potential for purification and and its ability to give us potentially a clarity about what it is that's taking place between the human being and the spiritual world. So I would like to read this particular passage from Dante. And this again comes from the Purgatory and it's in Canto 27. As when his earliest shaft of light assails the city where his maker shed his blood, when Ebro lies beneath the lifted scales and noontide scorches down on Ganges flood, so rode the sun. Thus day was nightward winging when there before us God's glad angel stood. He on the bank across the flames stood singing Beati Mundo Cordi with a sound more than all earthly music sweet and ringing. Then, holy souls, there's no way on or round but through the bite of fire. In then and come nor be ye deaf to what is sung beyond. So Dante's giving this description of having achieved the seventh cornice of the purgatory, which is this going through this process of purification. The Beati Mondo Cordi is coming from the um, Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so he's aligning this particular saying to this experience of passing through the fire. And he does speak in this moment about a memory of fire that really is frightening him. And that Virgil at this point says to him, you don't need to be afraid of this fire. This is a fire of purification. It's not one that's going to burn you. And beyond this is Beatrice, your beloved and a higher, greater mystery. And so I like this as a context for thinking about coming toward the 100th anniversary of the fire that destroyed the first Gertianum and that we now living only with a, a, a historical account. I don't know that any of us are alive that would have a memory of that event, but that these flames belong to that picture that we have and that they can be particularly through this celestial configuration with Mars coming opposite the sun and uh, the opportunity for righting a wrong or potentially for forgiveness and Uranus with its innovation and invention that something new can come into this picture, that something is sounding that seems similar to the configuration that occurred at the time that the foundation stone was laid and that that's going to recur, although not in the same region of the zodiac, but this seems to me to be pointing toward um, a new but also a deepening and renewed relationship to this mystery. And then this from T.S. Eliot's, uh, one of his four quartets, Little Gidding. What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end 
is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. So I liked this particular passage because in thinking about what ended with the flames that consumed the first Gertianum, Rudolf Steiner then refers to on the first anniversary of the fire as a significant beginning for the anthroposophical movement. We shall only become worthy of having been permitted to build that Gertianum if today in remembering it, we vow before whatever is best and most divine in each of our souls to keep faith with the spiritual impulses that had been given an outer form in that Gertianum. It was possible for this Gertianum to be taken from us. The spirit of this Gertianum, if our will is truly upright and honest, cannot be taken from us. So I feel very much that this belongs to the picture of what's sounding in the cosmos right now, particularly because of where we are uh, historically in relationship to this event in the anthroposophical movement. And then to close this picture, I just took last night walking north along the shore of Lake Michigan. I was taken by that cloud that seemed to be like a, the horn of a unicorn. And then there was a pink rain later last night. So it seemed very, very magical. But to point out that when we come to the time of St. John's, which is one week from tonight. So on June 24th, 2022, when according to Carl Koenig, we're breathing out our, uh, all of 2022, it's as though freed and we begin to receive the substance of 2023. If we put this in the context of a normal human gestation and the 280 day rhythm of the physical body of the human being, then nine months from St. John's takes us to the Feast of Annunciation 2023. So what I try to look for each year is does something announce itself at St. John's that I can experience again at this Feast of Annunciation, which is Gabriel coming across the threshold into the physical world to announce to Mary, should she choose to accept this Annunciation that she will bear the Christ child. And from that moment, the Feast of Annunciation, which is celebrated on the 25th of March, nine months later, will bring us to Christmas 2023. So I think that these are significant rhythms to pay attention to right now because we are within, uh, within the breadth of the Christmas conference. This St. John's nine months ahead of Annunciation, which itself is nine months ahead of Christmas 2023, which is 100 years from the seminal deed of Rudolf Steiner of the Christmas conference, where the foundation stone that was laid into the earth becomes a mantric rhythm laid into the heart of the human being so that now that foundation can be found in the human being and that Gertianum and the spirit of that Gertianum realized when we come together out of the shared striving informed by anthroposophy in the service of Michael, in a striving to realize the mystery of the Christ on the earth. Okay. So I'm going to stop my screen share. All right. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for your highly artistic presentation. So dear friends, we are slowly moving into a uh, question and answer section. Uh, please find the bottom in the, bo in the bottom of your screen. So it's, um, it's uh, uh, icon reactions. Click on it, and there's uh, one of buttons, raise hand. Yes, so please do it. So in chronological order, so you can ask question for Mary. Don't be shy. Oh, Helena, Helena, she's raising your, her hand. Helena, go ahead. Please just unmute your computer. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mary, I would like uh, to ask you, can you repeat 
once more, I'm sure you mentioned it at least two times, but I didn't get it. So which seeds do we seed or plant after St. John's Day for the year 2023? So I think I heard you say, what seeds do we plant? Yeah. So if what you I talk about it, that we plant some seeds for 2023. So what I understood Carl Koenig to mean in his description is that the seed just begins to form at that time. So it's not the time for planting, but kind of just receiving, it's beginning to form. So when we think about the, the plant kingdom at St. John's, you could imagine that the blossoms have, uh, have offered themselves up and now the kind of the fructification is taking place and the, the fruit will begin to form in which we will find the seed, but not until the harvest. So not until the time of Michaelmas, but it's just beginning to form now. And so we can begin, I think, it, takes, it, it does take a lot of work and repeated effort year after year to begin to sense what is it that begins to form at that time. Yeah. So the seed itself will come. Mm -hmm. And what really is it? And what can I do that the, the seed will come and ripen? Yes. Like with the food? Yes. Plant. So what I do is I have a rhythmic practice with sunrise and sunset. Also a meditative practice. Also paying attention to my dreams and a regular looking back to see if what I'm encountering in my thought life through meditation, through waking and sleeping, through dream life, is something showing itself that belongs to what the year is. It's self-discovery and research. Self-discovery. That I, I take myself as the research subject. And it's, it's more than just mood. But what is it that's occurring in my life? Is it aligned to these points in the cycle of the year? Equinox, solstice. Does it come to a certain expression in the festival life? Easter, St. John's, Michaelmas, Christmas. Are these just traditions? Or is there something truly living in it that I can experience in my life? If not, or if so, how can I engage and deepen my experience of that? Because Rudolf Steiner describes how at Christmas time, it's as though we experience the Christ being through an archangel and that this being moves beside us from Christmas until the time of Easter and then disappears into us. Mm. How do we experience that? Yeah. And then Carl Koenig will say, this festival cycle then completes at Whitsun. And now here we are having this conversation or this me talking to you about this in this period of cessation from Whitsun to St. John's. Where has the Christ being gone? The calendar of the soul verse, lose yourself to find yourself. Something is being offered up. And how can I hmm, position myself to receive what wants to come? particularly when I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but I can be receptive. I can trust in the substance that comes toward me, the information, the content from through spiritual science, through community celebration and listen. So I, I, I hope that that's, it's not really an answer, but trying to touch a way to answer that mighty question. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. A lot of work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you very much. Uh, here is a question from Anne and Rose. Anne and Rose, yeah. Thank you. Um, we had a question about how often does that config? Hear me, okay? Yeah, it's uh, okay. Yes. How often does that configuration occur? That. Um, it's somewhat rare. It has occurred again since then, and I apologize that I can't say exactly how many times, but it does occur. I was surprised that I saw at least two times it had occurred since 1913. To me, that seemed like a lot because to actually get a lunar eclipse and a Mercury at superior conjunction seemed like, wow, that's, that's something. Uh, but it does occur, but not that often. We have lunar eclipses every year, twice each year. We'll have Mercury at superior conjunction three times a year, but for those things to land at the same time. I, yeah, you could, I think you could do the math to figure out statistically what, how often it would happen. I can't do that kind of math. Four Thank times you. in a hundred years. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. you Mary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Leon. Thank you. And uh, gosh, uh, another one, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, this is kind of a lazy question because if I could use my computer at the same time as I'm using it for this, I could look it up myself. Uh, but what is the location or, or at least the sign or the constellation in which the new node is for the conjunction on June 31. July 31. Oh. Yes. In oh, the goodness. tropical zodiac, it will be in Taurus. Okay. About 18 degrees of Taurus. And that puts the south node in Scorpio. So this also adds an interesting nuance in that Scorpio is traditionally ruled by Mars and Taurus is traditionally ruled by Venus. So we have this quality of the feminine and the masculine. And, yeah. uh, and what is it that, that, what is the potential that's happening between the feminine and the masculine, both in the individual and in the social realm? I'm partly interested. It's encounter. Okay, uh, in the nodes because, um, my, I have a, you know, a brother and a son whose north node is opposite my north node, both of them, we're on the same axis. So where these are located affects all three of us, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the other one isn't a question, but just to uh, let you know, my birthday is the first. So I, I know sort of how to relate to that this coming year. The first of which month? January. Oh, January 1st, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Well. Happy birthday, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so more questions, friends. Anyway, I think it's going to take a time. Um, yeah, it well. happens a lot. It's a lot to take in. It stirs this, it stirs the inner picture. So, yeah, dear friends, I, I, I promise to um, post video of this presentation on our website immediately after we finish this session. Probably tomorrow morning, you can take a look again. So, and uh, maybe it's time to just say, Thank you so much to Mary for her effort and uh, highly artistic presentation with excellent rhythm. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I took a clue from the last one, slow down. Yeah, because so lots of people are uh, watching your videos in slow motion. So now it was absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. If you have yeah, questions, just yeah, just you can email me. <laughs>
Yes. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, yeah. Mary. Yes. Please thank unmute you. yourself and uh, yes. yeah, thank say you, Mary. thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Breathtaking. Thank you ever so much. Awesome. Right. Thank, thank you, you, Mary. Beautiful. We thank were blessed you, tonight, Mary. Mary. Thank you. Thank and you have such beautiful uh, scenes from where you live. <laughs> I, I, I really feel that I'm, I'm quite yeah. fortunate in my environment. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm about to go out there again. <laughs> okay. okay. We want to go to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Beautiful place to, place to stargaze. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, again okay. for having me. Yeah. Very welcome, Mary. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Sandra. Good bye. to see you. Yeah. Good yeah. night, friends. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye, Rosemary. Bye, Mary. Good to see you again, Robin and Christoph. Same here. Thank you. Thank you. And Patricia, you too. And Meg and Judy, Diana and Leon, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you on the ferry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. You're all invited to come up and cruise under the stars with me. They're wonderful cruises. Thank you. Okay. Mm. All right. Good night, friends. Good night. Good night, Andre. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.